Well, first of all, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Keith St. Clair. I teach political science in the social science department here at GRCC. And I certainly appreciate your uh, coming to hear what I have to say about the Palestinians. Uh, what I want to do today is basically address who the Palestinians are, um, what has led to their current situation, what their current situation is, and uh, what are the prospects um, for the future. And I've called my talk um, Between a Rock and a Holy Place um, because I wanted to include uh, Jordan. Um, basically, I want to talk about Israel, the occupied territories known as the West Bank and Gaza, and Jordan, where uh, the vast majority of a lot of Palestinians live. And even in Jordan, it is suspected now that Palestinians are the majority of the population in the state of Jordan. So uh, it, it's uh, appropriate, I think, um, that, th that the title fits. So here we are, Israel, the West Bank, Gaza, and Jordan. And of course, right next to Iraq. Uh, the word Palestinian comes from the word Philistine. And uh, here's my representation of a Philistine. And actually, uh, possibly, I, I think he looks like a g Goliath. Um, and certainly, uh, uh, the Jewish ancestor David uh, took on Goliath. And we know about the, through the Bible, about the conflicts between uh, the Israelites and the Philistines. And so the word Palestine is, uh, refers to that. And so that's where the name comes from. Now, I don't mean to suggest that the Palestinians today are uh, necessarily direct descendants of the Philistines, but I'm just telling you where the, the derivation of the, of the term comes from. Certainly, um, what do we know about the Philistines uh, of the Bible? Uh, it's historically, uh, it is thought that they were a sea people that settled uh, in what the area of what is now known as Gaza, and uh, some of them think that they came from um, Greece. So there's some speculation there. Um, but the term has obviously stuck, and certainly the Romans used it. Uh, even the British, during their occupation in the early 20th century, referred to this region as Palestine. And so uh, I don't think that the Palestinians today are direct descendants. Certainly there's been uh, vast movements of people, migrations. The people today don't speak the same language that the Philistines would have uh, spoken. There's, there's, they speak Arabic for the most part. Um, and of course, when you have vast migrations of people, intermarriage happens, and um, so I don't know if they're a, a direct descent. That said, I think maybe you could say maybe the same for the Jews um, that are now living in Israel. I don't know if they're, uh, we could say for sure that they're direct descendants of the Jews of the biblical period. Certainly their name comes from that period. Certainly they have uh, uh, a similar religion, but they don't even have the same religion. Um, because the, the Jews in King David's time, um, whatever their leaders might have been doing, the people were definitely worshiping more than one God. Uh, the Jews really didn't uh, fully embrace monotheism until after the Babylonian exile, where they probably borrowed the idea from the Zoroastrians. So, um, and of course, many Israelites today, not all of them, but many of them are descended from European Jews, the Ashkenazi Jews, and they certainly intermingled uh, despite the segregation throughout the Middle Ages that existed. There was much inter, uh, intermarriage or at least uh, uh, commingling. And so who can say who is really descended from who? I'm, for example, um, you know, the, the Prussians of the 19th century are not in any way related to the Prussians um, in the early Middle Ages. But the name from the region stuck. Uh, my name, St. Clair, uh, says that I, I assumes that I'm descended from uh, the Normans, right, who settled uh, northern France and then when it came over with William the Conqueror to, to England. But uh, can I sh say for certainly that, uh, that I'm a literal, uh, literal descendant? I, I, I doubt it. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, mixing. If you believe the Da Vinci Code, I guess I'm supposed to be descended from uh, Jesus and Mary Magdalene, but I don't believe the Da Vinci Code <laughs> on that basis either. But the, the name, at least the name comes from there. So there's some significance to that. And names are important. And here, uh, there's something I like about Arab names. And uh, 
this is, in effect, an Arab name. You have Abu Karim, Muhammad al-Jamil, Ibn Nadal, Ibn Abdul Aziz al-Filistini. And uh, that's my poor attempt to uh, pronounce it, but basically Abu is the word for father of, so Abu Karim would be father of Karim. Uh, the name Muhammad al-Jamil, which would be, Jamil I think is beautiful. Um, Ibn Nadal, Ibn is, the, is um, similar to bin, like bin, bin Laden, Osama bin Laden. Bin Laden means uh, um, uh, son of, son of Laden. And so this would be son of Nidal, son of uh, Abdul Aziz, um, Abdul is servant of, and Aziz is one of the many names for God, uh, meaning magnificent. So servant of God, uh, of uh, Philistini, meaning of Palestine, Palestinian. And so uh, there's a, in Arab names, you can discern a lot about a person if, uh, if they really want to reveal that. Here you have some symbols uh, that I took on the wall around the city of Jerusalem. And here you have uh, a Star of David. And what was pointed out to me when we were touring here, and this, my travels in this area go back to last year, that the Star of David is not, was not originally ex or, or exclusively a Jewish symbol. Uh, it was definitely a symbol of, of the legendary King David, but it wasn't always a symbol that was automatically associated with Judaism. Uh, that, I think, happened more recently with the, the, the Jewish nationalism that developed in the 19th century and the idea of Zionism. And when they adopted the World Zionist Movement, they adopted the Star of David. And since then, it has become very closely associated with Judaism, as it was even during the Holocaust in the Second World War. But it's interesting to note that uh, much earlier, the, the Star of David was used even by the Turks. So here, this is a Turkish wall built by the Ottoman Turks, and here they are using uh, this symbol. It, it's, uh, it wasn't exclusively a Jewish symbol for uh, most of history. And yet, uh, the, the Jews obviously use it now. Uh, in fact, I was told the more, the more appropriate symbol throughout the ages was more uh, the menorah, uh, was the more appropriate symbol that uh, the Jews used. This is uh, Masada, and this is very important in Jewish symbolism, and as it is in Israel. Uh, this represents the period when the temple was destroyed in a revolt in around 66, 67 AD, or a common era. And uh, the Romans who ruled the place at the time put it down, and the last holdout was this uh, precipice in the, uh, in the desert near the Dead Sea. And you can see why maybe this was the last holdout of the Jews and the Zealots that, that took this place, because it was, it was easy to defend. And uh, although they hoped to escape the conquest of the Romans, the Romans were determined to have them. And, uh, and although the Romans probably could have easily have just avoided um, taking this place, they were out to prove a point, and that you didn't resist the empire. And although I think it took the better part of three years, uh, the Romans surrounded this. This is a view looking down. And you can see for miles, it was, it's an amazing uh, a fortress. Uh, King Herod also used it. And here, um, I don't know if you can see it, but you can still see the Roman forts. I mean, uh, here in the desert, everything lasts. You've got the Roman wall. Uh, the Roman forts are clearly marked out surrounding Masada. And it's, it's almost from the top, it looked like the Roman army could be down there uh, to this day. And here's the, here's the Roman Sixth Legion based in Jerash, Jordan, and uh, these are reenactors, but um, it wasn't the Sixth Legion that took out uh, Masada, I don't believe. This is how they did it. They built a ramp, the Romans built a ramp all the way up to the top where they could take their siege engines, and, and of course the legend has it that when they got up there, the Jews uh, killed themselves, rather be taken alive. And this has cr become a very nationalistic symbol uh, originally for the Zionist movement, but also now for the state of Israel since it's gained independence. And uh, many uh, Israeli soldiers swear allegiance here, and, uh, and so it's an important symbol for the state of Israel, and it, it, sh it shows their connection to this place. When the Romans defeated them, they destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. Years later, there was another revolt. The Romans again put it down, and the Jews were forcibly removed 
from um, Jerusalem, and they were banned from the city for many years. And it really wouldn't be until the Muslims came that Jews would be allowed back, which is interesting because uh, the Christians would take it before then with the Byzantines, and uh, they too, like the Romans, didn't allow the Jews uh, much freedom. And it was, really the, it was really the liberation by uh, the Arab Muslim forces that allowed the Jews to return to the city. Somewhat ironic considering the recent relationships today. This is where um, the, the, the Palestinians and, um, and the Jews of Israel have a, a, a common denominator in that they both look to um, Abraham as their founders. Uh, most of the Palestinians are Muslim, not all of them, but most of them are. And those who are Muslim claim uh, descent uh, from Abraham through his son Ishmael. And the Israelis take their name um, uh, from the, uh, Isaac, the son of, of, um, of um, Abraham. And so this is the tomb of the patriarchs where Abraham is considered to have been buried. And inside, uh, you've got his cenotaph, which is a fake uh, grave so stone. His, if his body is there, it would be much lower than this. And both uh, Muslims and Jews come here to pay reverence to Abraham. And uh, because of uh, um, a Jew in the 1990s broke in and gunned down a bunch of uh, praying Muslims in this period, there now is a segregation of the two. And here you have a bulletproof glass where the Jews would come to this window and the uh, Muslims would be at the window that I'm looking at. And in case anyone had a firearm, they would be prevented from firing at the other. Oh, excuse me, this is Hebron. Hebron, uh, the tomb of the patriarchs is in the, in, thank you, is in the important city of Hebron, which is therefore holy to both Muslims and Jews. And for, unfortunately for that, it, it, it seems to be a conflict point. Um, where violence tends to occur, usually it's in Hebron. This is inside, and this, this is the tombs of, uh, of Abraham's children and his wives, and their wives. This is uh, Megiddo. This is in Israel today, and it uh, was originally called Har Megiddo, referring to the, the, the point on which this uh, um, outpost resided, and uh, it's been roughly translated into Armageddon. And so this is uh, supposedly where the, according to the book of Revelation, where the last battle is to take place. So Armageddon, or Armageddon, uh, for the last battle. But what I learned while I was there, and these are the ruins, uh, is that the battle's already been fought. And, uh, and the British won it. Um, it took place during the First World War, when the British uh, defeated the Turks, uh, General Allenby. Uh, was the victor of Megiddo. So uh, I don't know if that caused you to rest easier at night, but the, the battle has been fought. In fact, it's been fought probably 25 times, uh, at least, throughout history. This, this, was, a, um, this was a major outpost uh, governing trade routes, and even the Egyptians battled here. So battles have been going on throughout history, and so uh, for me to uh, predict another battle here, uh, I think is a, uh, an easy guess. All right, so here, uh, here you have uh, Israel, which was founded in 1948. Um, in 1967, they took the West Bank and Gaza, and uh, by that time, Jordan had been created. Uh, all of this area at one time was governed by the Ottoman Turks, and this is what's left of the Turkish, um, the country of Turkey. But all of this was ruled by Turkey at the time during, up until the end of World War I. And it was after World War I that the Allied powers broke it up. And uh, the British, of course, were interested in uh, Jordan. They ended up keeping Palestine for themselves. Um, and at that time, Palestine included Jordan. Um, even amongst the Zionists, they, when they wanted to create the State of Israel, they anticipated some of them uh, creating it both out of what is now Jordan and what is now Israel. Uh, the, the French ended up occupying Lebanon and Syria. And in about 1922, after the, uh, or during when the League of Nations was giving the British the international legitimacy to govern this area, uh, the British decided that they were going to divide 
what was uh, they were calling Palestine, and they broke off the, the what is known as the East Bank of the Jordan River and called it Transjordan, what is today now known as Jordan. They kept the West Bank of the Jordan River and called that Palestine. This is the um, this happens to be the flag of Jordan, but the colors on this flag are important because they they represent uh, um, the Arab nationalist movement. Uh, it, they represent the Arab revolt that helped uh, the British defeat the Turks during the First World War. Um, I believe the, uh, the, the white and the black uh, and the green represent the various caliphates of uh, the Arab empires of old. Uh, the red was the color chosen by uh, Sharif Hussein during the First World War uh, to represent the Arab revolt. And the Jordanians have added a star, a seven-pointed star that reflects the um, the seven uh, uh, sur surahs in the, in, the, in the Quran of the first, uh, the first surah, seven verses of the first surah. Now, so you go throughout the Arab world and you find these colors on their flags. And so the Palestinian flag is the same, just without the star. And in fact, uh, during the occupation of the West Bank, when the, uh, when the PLO was still considered a terrorist organization and the Israelis didn't want to see any Palestinian flag. Um, uh, I remember my Palestinian professor mentioned that they would cut a watermelon in half because the watermelon had the same colors as the, um, as the flag. You had the green, the white, the black, and the, and the red. And so that was kind of uh, subversive uh, and there wasn't much the Israelis could do about the, the watermelon. So here you have uh, Israel and originally um, when the British decided that they couldn't hold it anymore and they were facing attacks both by Arabs and Jews and, uh, um, and Jews had immigrated to this region from Europe throughout the British rule and even during the Ottoman period that was going on and at first the British encouraged it um, during World War I through the Balfour Declaration um, encouraging Jews to rise up and help fight for them during the First World War and then the reward would be a, home, a homeland in Palestine. And um, they later said that maybe, the British later said that that didn't necessarily mean a state, but at the time they really did intend that it was going to be a state eventually. By the time the British left though, chaos had broken out as uh, the Arabs resisted the influx of all of these European Jews that were coming. They saw this as a European colony and they attempted to, to eradicate it. And uh, the United Nations endorsed the, the separation of this region into two, uh, one for the Jews and one for the Arabs. Um, that was not agreed to and it meant war. And so um, the orange area roughly corresponds to what the United Nations might have uh, given them. Um, I don't think the Negev Desert was necessarily included in that, but uh, after the 1948 war, the Israelis were able to fight uh, to that point, basically up to the green. And they even got into the western outskirts of the city of Jerusalem. And so Jerusalem became a divided city. Jordan and the other Arab states came to the defense of their Arab cousins, the Palestinians, and of course were on the losing side. So Egypt ended up occupying what is known as the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, the West Bank of the Jordan River, went to Jor what is now known as Jordan. And by the way, Jordan um, actually comes from the term, uh, Dan was one of the tribes of, of Israel. And uh, Dan, uh, although started down here, the, eventually they found their way up here because of the Philistines. And so the Jordan River means of Dan, or coming, flowing from D Dan. Which, so the Jordan River got the name first, and then it would later apply to uh, the East Bank which is now the independent state of Jordan. So with the coming of Israel and the subsequent wars after that, uh, you've, you see um, the breakdown in the current population of Palestinians. There are 1.4 million Palestinians who live in Israel and therefore have Israeli citizenship, meaning that they were caught on that side of the border when the fighting ended. Many other Palestinians fled, fled the fighting, and fled for their lives, and many of them are now refugees. Uh, some of them live in what is known as the West Bank, 2.4 million there. Um, in the Gaza Strip, 1.4 million, and over 4 million of their descendants throughout the rest of the world, many of them in Jordan. 
And in fact, this number is uh, suspected to be low because there's, there's about 6 million uh, people in Jordan. And it is now thought that the, the, the Palestinians outnumber the indigenous Jordanians. Uh, in Israel, fi about 5.4 million, uh, and in the rest of the world, uh, 7.5 million, many of them in the United States. So certainly the United States has become a very important country to even the current state of Israel. And it partly explains the close relationship between the two. Now, many of these Palestinians fled the fighting of 1948, and they would fl flee the fighting later, in later years as well. And when they went to a lot of these Arab countries, although they were Arabs in the fact that they spoke Arabic, uh, they had already by this time established their own identity as Palestinian. Nationalism in the 19th century, in effect, had affected them as well, not just the world Jews. And, uh, and so, um, so they come to see themselves as Palestinian even though they speak Arabic. And par the idea of a pan-Arab society that Nasser of Egypt spoke of really kind of uh, died with him. And, um, and the Arabs in these other countries, and the Arab world extends from Morocco across North Africa, throughout the Middle East, and Iraq is an Arab country predominantly, um, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Oman, um, Lebanon. A lot of these other countries didn't treat the Palestinian refugees that came there very well. Uh, if anything, Jordan had probably treated them the best because Jordan did extend citizenship to them, which is more than a lot of the other ones have done. In Lebanon, they really aren't treated very well. Um, and they still continue to live in refugee camps to this day. This shows you the census figures that the British took while they governed it, and then I've basically um, updated it to 2003. Uh, in 1919, there were 60,000 Jews in Palestine, according to the British, uh, of which, so about 8% of the total population. So the Arabs vastly outnumbered the Jews at this time, despite the fact that Jews had been coming there since the 19th century with the pogroms in Russia, fleeing the persecutions there. Um, still, by this time, only 60,000. By 1932, you can see how rapidly uh, immigration is bringing up their numbers, 192,000 uh, or 20% of the Palestinian population. By 1939, 500,000 or 33% of the Palestinian population are Jews. And you can imagine if you are an Arab and how you might find that to be alarming. And the, Pal the, the Palestinians and the Arabs that lived there were desperate for the British to cut off that immigration. They just felt that they were being crowded out. Now, um, it is true that the, a lot of the Jews that came there did buy the land, but uh, uh, there are many of them are coming from Europe, uh, comparatively better off, comparatively more wealthy than this region of, of uh, what had been the Ottoman Empire. And uh, I guess I kind of, uh, I guess I kind of draw the analogy in the United States when we were colonizing this continent uh, from Europe, and certainly there were people who were already here. And in many cases, we did claim that we purchased the land. Certainly Manhattan was claimed to be purchased uh, for a bunch of beads, but uh, from the Indian point of view, uh, you know, that looks like thievery uh, or it looks like exploitation. So whether it was technically purchased or not from the Arab or Palestinian point of view is kind of overlooks the fact that, it, that they were exploited and that they were, uh, um, that their economic impoverishment was taken advantage of. And so they don't respect uh, any purchases uh, along those lines. And there was a, a efforts by the Palestinians to prevent their fellow Palestinians from selling that land to Jews, as there are now rules that prevent Jews from selling to Arabs. And so uh, they have definitely caught on to how this game is played on both sides. Today we have uh, over 5.4 million, uh, and if you add the same territory that the British were censor, uh, using, which would include the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, that's about 51% of the people living there being Jews. Now there's a lot of Israel, is, Israelites who would not like me using that figure because obviously those living in the West Bank and Gaza are not citizens of Israel today and so they would have me only count the Arabs or Palestinians that live in Israel proper and uh, have Israeli citizenship. If you count that then Jews are about 80, 82 percent of the population. Still rather striking that uh, amongst all Israeli citizens, 
almost 20% of the people are not Jewish, most of them being Muslim or Christian Palestinians. Almost one in five, uh, even though they have citizenship of Israel, don't really identify with being an, an Israeli. Uh, it's, a, it's a dilemma that the Israel continues to have to wrestle with. And the last thing they want to do is add more people and extend citizenship to the West Bank and Gaza, because you could see they would quickly be down to barely a majority, which, is the, uh, which they fear then, how could they continue to call themselves a Jewish state? This is, uh, this is a uh, Palestinian or Arab-Israeli, as, the, as um, Jews like to refer to them, meaning she is of Arab descent, her ancestors were Palestinian, she now lives in Israel and she has Israeli citizenship because her ancestors did not flee the land. They stayed on the Israeli side of the border when the war ended. Those eventually got citizenship, so her family did. And so she has privileges that uh, Palestinians who live in the occupied territories and who do not have citizenship don't have. In effect, she is a full citizen. She can vote. She can come and go from Israel as she pleases. And uh, although the Arab parties in Israel don't tend to win <laughs> the elections because they're so outnumbered, uh, nevertheless, she can, uh, she can vote. Yes? Yes, yes. The, uh, because in, in it, to get by in Israel, is Hebrew has become the language of Israel. After all, they had all these Jews coming from all over the world, and they, many of them spoke different languages. And the one thing that they had in common was the ancient language of Hebrew. And so Hebrew was very much resurrected with the coming of Israel as a state. It's funny because in the 19th century, Hebrew was almost a dead language. Uh, it was really only spoken in religious ceremonies, very much like Latin is today. And in fact, many uh, um, Orthodox Jews resented uh, speaking Hebrew because they saw it as blasphemy. It was, a, it was a sacred language not to be spoken in a secular way. And there were many Orthodox Jews that resisted uh, the adoption of Hebrew as the, as the spoken language uh, of Israel. Well, uh, I guess they've learned to accommodate that because that is in fact what has happened. But uh, in fact, there were some Orthodox Jews who were absolutely opposed to the idea of an, a state of Israel. Uh, uh, some of the most religious Jews fought against the independence of Israel because they did not want to see uh, a state brought about by man. God was supposed to bring about the recreation of Israel, not man. And they considered it blasphemy uh, for, that, for there to be Zionist secular Jews to, to want to do that. Well, they ended up coming around to it because in the, the fighting that broke out in the 1920s and 30s between the Arabs and the Jews, the, uh, the Orthodox Jews who didn't uh, have the, the military means to defend themselves often found themselves murdered uh, by Arabs. And so maybe perhaps out of necessity, they en ended up accommodating uh, the idea of a state of Israel. And they've, they've come around to it since then, although the, you can find a few Orthodox Jews who uh, are still opposed to it. This is uh, the Arab party. Um, uh, called Balad, and they, they run uh, politicians for office. Uh, like I said, their party doesn't have much hope of winning in the Israeli parliament, the Knesset, but nevertheless, they do have political parties, they do vote, and only uh, Palestinians who have Israeli citizenship would be able to vote for them. Nevertheless, uh, it's a difficult situation for these, is, uh, what the Jews call Arab Israelis, Israelis who are, who are Arab, because they're not Jewish. Most of them are Muslim. Some of them are Christian, and uh, they don't identify with a lot of the symbolism of the Israeli state, the name itself. They would prefer it to be called Palestine. They would find that a much more inclusive name than the state of Israel, which obviously has certain historical and religious connotations that they don't identify with. And so yet, they're, they're citizens of a state that they don't really feel fully identifying with. And that's, that's, imagine the difficulty of that. Uh, here's the Israeli flag, and now it uh, does adopt the, uh, the Jewish Star of David, and certainly that has its symbolism. Uh, the, the stripes rep, uh, are reminiscent of a Jewish prayer shawl, and yet uh, citizens of Israel who are not Jews are expected to be loyal to a state represented by this flag. And, and it's, frankly, I think it would be difficult. Imagine 
Imagine this flag if you had to pledge allegiance to it. Now there's a lot of people in this country who wouldn't have a problem with that. Uh, a lot of people think that uh, we've gone too far by separating church and state. And there's a lot of people who think America is a Christian nation by birth and that, that that fact should continue and we should proclaim it proudly. But there are many citizens of the United States who are not Christian, uh, albeit a minority. Nevertheless, Jews, Muslims, I'm sure, would have difficulty pledging allegiance to this flag. So, uh, not that it's a perfect analogy, but I think you can begin to see the mindset and, and put yourself in the place of Arab Israelis who don't identify with the state being called Israel and don't identify with that flag. And of course, the greater Jewish population looks upon them as suspect, as possible traitors. And, and, uh, and they do face some discrimination because of that, even though they have rights under the law in Israel. Now, these are... Uh, um, some ultra-Orthodox Jews, um, and like I said, at the, early on in the 20th century, they would have been opposed to the founding of Israel and would have been opposed to speaking Hebrew uh, in a secular context. And even to this day, some of them will speak Yiddish instead to avoid that and stay true to their beliefs. Nevertheless, they have come to accommodate the idea of Israel, and, and of course, they can be very loyal to the state now. But many of them still do not choose to serve in the military. Uh, and they are exempt from military service in Israel because of their uh, religious studies. And frankly, there are a lot of secular Jews, and many Zionists early on were very secular, who are to this day very uncomfortable with them because of their, they're seen as kind of uh, uh, fundamentalist uh, in their religious uh, traditions that they seem to be extreme. Uh, there's a lot of secular Jews, although I, who identify as being Jewish, don't really necessarily uh, hold true to kosher foods or they don't necessarily hold true to the Sabbath. And, uh, and yet Jerusalem is being, receiving a big influx of the most Orthodox because it is such an important holy city. Um, some secular Jews in Israel speak of the neighborhoods as turning black. And what they mean by that is they mean the ultra-Orthodox Jews who dress that way. And, they, and many secular Jews in Jerusalem are actually leaving the city now going to the more secular city of Tel Aviv because they're beginning to feel very uncomfortable with uh, what people that they don't really identify with either. So we, we also have to remember not only are the Arabs not a monolithic society, with, they have their own internal divisions, you certainly find the same equally true amongst Israelis, even amongst Israeli Jews. They don't all get along. This is the symbol of Jerusalem, uh, the Jerusalem cross uh, adopted by the Christians. And it refers to uh, the, various, er, the four quarters of Jerusalem. And here you see that the, the four traditional quarters are the Jewish quarter, the Muslim quarter, the Christian quarter, and then the Armenian quarter. The Armenians, by the way, were the first state to adopt Christianity officially. Um, and they started immigrating here uh, even before the seventh century, but by that time, they had had a very uh, important presence, and their presence has remained, even though they are uh, Christian. So uh, the, the current Israeli government has continued this tradition and, and allowed these quarters to remain uh, mostly segregated, although it's not impossible for others to move into their different areas. Many of the people do ch stand, tend to want to live next to their own. Keep in mind that I'm only talking about the old city. This is the old city that the Ottomans had built the wall around, the Ottoman Turks. Jerusalem has grown massively since that time, and what would have been sprawling suburbs have now been incorporated into greater Jerusalem. And so this, although the historic traditional city, is just a small portion of what Jerusalem is today. And actually, when the fighting stopped in 1948 and 49, the uh, ceasefire line or the armistice line went right down the side of the old city. The old city remained in the Muslim Arab quarter and it was West Jerusalem, the newer part of the city, that this new state of Israel called as its capital. It wasn't until the 1967 war that the Israelis would end up taking not only all of Jerusalem but the West Bank and Gaza. This is uh, Actually, this is the Haram al-Sharif, the sacred sanctuary, and the Dome of the Rock, and the Alaska Mosque. 
And here you see a picture of the Dome of the Rock, which is uh, sacred to Muslims because this is where a Muhammad ascended to heaven. Uh, he, uh, he came here on a winged horse uh, one night and ascended to heaven in this way. And uh, he ascended from a rock that's right here. And the Muslims and the, and the Arab Empire that came after commemorated that by building this shrine. And uh, it, it's, it's one of the oldest buildings in uh, the Muslim world and certainly one of the most beautiful. Unfortunately, it's built on supposedly the site of the, of the, the ancient temple uh, of the Jews, uh, the very temple that the Romans destroyed. And uh, it is believed that it is here is where uh, Jews consider the divine presence of God to, uh, to be at its strongest. And uh, there are many Jews who would like to rebuild the temple um, and for, the, for the priest uh, ceremonies. And yet to do so would mean, in effect, uh, demolishing what is there now uh, for the Arabs and the Muslims. Rolling. Yes, I forgot to mention that as well, but you're absolutely right. Tradition has it that this is also the very rock that Abraham uh, uh, was going to sacrifice his son until God uh, prevented him. Right. Yeah, they differ on which son it was, but uh, the, both the Muslims and the Jews would uh, agree that, that this was the spot that that occurred. And they've also put a, uh, one of the most important mosques. Uh, this is a close-up of the Dome of the Rock, and you see the intricate work. Very, very beautiful. Um, this is the Haram al-Sharif, which means noble sanctuary. This is the Temple Mount to the Jews. And the Jews, uh, the temple was completely destroyed. Not, nothing really remains of it, but what re does remain is a re of the retaining wall uh, that surrounded the uh, Temple Mount. And that's now known as the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall that Jews pray to, and it's just on the other side of this mosque. Uh, here's the mosque, and here's the Dome of the Rock Shrine. Uh, this is the third holiest mosque in, in, in Islam, next to the one in Mecca and, and the, uh, the holy city of Medina. Uh, Jerusalem is third in uh, its reverence. This is uh, what's important to Christians. Uh, you have the um, uh, Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and this is supposedly built on the very spot where Christ was crucified and was buried. And although originally it would have been outside the old city, um, uh, the city borders changed, and now it, it resides within the old city. And uh, here you have many pilgrims, uh, Christian pilgrims, who like to follow the, the passage of the cross. They carry their own cross with them, going through the various stages of Christ's uh, crucifixion. So a city very holy to Christians, Muslims, and Jews. Here you have Jews praying at the Wailing Wall, or the Western Wall. Uh, this is quite quite high, and you can see that in the cracks, Jews place their prayers uh, to be heard by God. And it is on the other side of this, within the rock, that they believe the divine presence uh, should always remain. Here's a close-up of the cracks. You can see some of the prayers. This is the, uh, the plaza in front of that. The, G the Israelis, uh, when they took this in 1967, they cleared the plaza. This would had been full of uh, buildings. It was known as the Moroccan uh, area. And, um, and all of the people who lived here were cleared out uh, so that the, the Jews could have adequate access to the Wailing Wall. And here you can see the Dome of the Rock on top of it. On the other side of that wall, and this is, the, this is considered the Golden Gate of, of, uh, of Jerusalem, and it's, it's sealed, and it's only to be reopened when the Messiah uh, returns, or in the case of the Jews, comes. And uh, even, the, even the Muslims believe that Muhammad will come back at the end of days with the, the dead that are buried here. Jews also like to, uh, to bury their um, dead on the, uh, what is now known as um, uh, the Mount of Olives, uh, because it's believed that these will be the first to be resurrected uh, with the coming of the, the end times. This is uh, Daniel, um, who uh, was our guide in Jerusalem. He is actually a, uh, in charge of Jewish-Christian relations in the city, and he, he just gave us a fascinating tour of, uh, uh, of uh, what it's like to deal with the conflicting religions. And he says that Jerusalem is a very funny place. 
in that it does strange things to people. Uh, it is a holy city for Muslims, Jews, Christians, and uh, people come here and things happen to them. They, they, get, they get close to the physical uh, divine. They want to touch things. They want to touch where Christ was crucified. They want to touch the, the wailing wall that retained the, the original temple. Uh, they want to touch the, the rock that Muhammad ascended to heaven on. And they, it's, a, it's a, a mysticism that they want to experience the divine, and Jerusalem is a place that they can do that. And so it changes people when they get there. He, he, he told me on, in many cases people will come to Jerusalem and all of a sudden think that they're Christ or they'll think that they're Moses and they'll start uh, preaching. And it says, and what they have to do is they just have to take them to Tel Aviv or one of the other cities and then they become all right again. Uh, it's just that Jerusalem just does things to people. Yes. Your dad moved to Cairo in 1920? Right, I know that. So anyway, he had to move from Cairo to Jerusalem for six years and he had to kill all property. Okay. So he built a house in Jerusalem, the Mount Sakamon. But when he was with us now, the Holy Spirit, he said the thing that I remember for the six years that I lived there, that Jerusalem is a city of fire all the time between the Christian community. It is true that it, even the, it is, uh, it's a funny thing, but even within the various religious denominations, there's disagreements, and certainly within Christianity, you have the divide between the Orthodox, the Catholics, uh, Protestants, and, and, uh, and they don't always get along. In fact, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the, the, it's a Muslim that has to hold the keys to the church because the Orthodox and the Catholics and the, the Coptic Christians can't agree on who should be in charge, and so the Muslims have to be the peacekeepers there. Um, and so it, 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 is a, it, it is a city that divides people as well as brings them together, for sure. This is, in, this is a representation of that. This is a, uh, a, a bomb disposal unit. Uh, and, uh, of course, bombings can happen. When I was in Jerusalem, I was, I was struck. At first, when I got there, I was overwhelmed with optimism because I saw Jews, Muslims, Christians living side by side, uh, walking in the same streets, and I just thought, wow, this is, this is what it's all about. This is what, this is what uh, it should be worldwide. And, and it wasn't only after I looked a little closer that I realized that what I was seeing was much more disturbing. It's, it, they were living together for, in close proximity. They were living in close proximity, but they weren't interacting. Uh, Jews, Christians, Muslims, all going about their business. Uh, ignoring each other. It wasn't, uh, it ended up not being this pretty picture as I originally thought when I first arrived. Uh, this is where the picture gets a little bit more disturbing because this is the West Bank. Here's the Jordan River and this is the territory that Israel has taken since 1967 and although uh, some Israelis would like to see it formally annexed, uh, even the United States and most of the United Nations object and say that no, this is occupied territory and this has to be relinquished eventually. Uh, and yet it needs to be relinquished in a negotiated settlement. And so um, what uh, Israelis have done, however, is they've kind of violated that UN um, uh, resolution and they've actually built settlements over here, uh, in effect colonies. And this is in violation of, of the United Nations resolution. And they've also now, because of the recent violence, have now attempted to protect their own, which is kind of understandable, but in doing so, they've built a wall. And this wall is something new in this region of the world. And the Arabs uh, claim that it's not just for protection. That in fact, the wall has been effective in seizing more land uh, from Palestinians. And so it, it, it has become a dual-purpose tool. And here you can see the red line showing the, the lines of where the wall extends, and the green area where it attempts to encompass most of the Israeli settlements in the West Bank. And this is a, a representation, this is the wall, and this is a, a watchtower, and you see this uh, throughout the, the West Bank now, wherever you saw the red lines on the map. And certainly, uh, uh, you don't see it within Jerusalem, but uh, outside of Jerusalem. This is, um, I believe, this is Bethlehem. And so Bethlehem is now completely surrounded by a wall, and you can see that the wall goes right up to the buildings, 
and all of this farmland of the Arabs and the Palestinians, they can't tend to their olive trees and harvest their crops. Uh, they've been, they can see that the wall has been used to deprive them of even more use of the land. And of course, in Israel, if you don't use the land for a certain amount of time, it uh, defaults to the state. And this is the entryway into uh, Bethlehem and the wall and the, the barbed wire and uh, tour buses come and a rather pleasant sign welcomes you and it says happy holidays. This is some Israeli soldiers uh, patrolling the streets of, and I think this is Jerusalem. This is uh, in Bethlehem, the Palestinian graffiti. Uh, they've basically painted a, a picture of a dove, the symbol of peace, with a flak jacket on it. And you can see the uh, bullet holes in the wall uh, where the fighting has occurred. Yes? So getting through those walls, like into Bethlehem, is it similar to going in Canada, or does it just have to show like the passport? And they ask you to oh, yeah, I did have to have my passport when I went in, but you know, the Israeli soldiers didn't actually ask to see it. So uh, they recognized that we were a tourist group, and um, they discourage uh, travel to Bethlehem for sure. And I remember when I came across um, into Israel on my own, and then when I told them I had gone to the West Bank, they gave me, they detained me at the airport longer than I should have been detained. The message was kind of clear, you shouldn't be going to the West Bank. And Bethlehem is, is considered part of the West Bank. In fact, Israelis are not allowed to go there. And it's not the Palestinians that prevent them. It's the Israeli government that says Isra uh, is Israeli Jews are not allowed to go in there, ostensibly for security reasons. This is uh, more graffiti. I thought this was uh, kind of summed up the Palestinian attitude. To exist is to resist. Uh, and that their whole existence is based on resistance uh, to Israel. It's almost become their reason for being. Uh, this is uh, some Palestinians and an Israeli soldier. Um, you know, when I was there, I actually came across an Israeli soldier who was a Muslim, and I was just astounded um, because uh, most Muslims who are Israeli citizens would be exempt, just like the ultra-Orthodox Jews, from serving. So he apparently wanted to serve, and I, I remember asking my translator to ask him why, how he felt about enforcing Israeli rule over his ethnic cousins in occupied territories. And my translator said, there's no way I'm going to ask him that. Not a chance. It was just too uncomfortable. This is out just outside of Bethlehem. This is one of those Israeli settlements I was talking about. It's known as Har Homa. And you can see they, they tend to be up on hills, uh, easy, easily defensive terrain. Uh, they almost look like forts. And you can see that the settlements have uh, proliferated throughout the West Bank. Uh, some say that, they're, that the, it's, in some ways it's by design. Certainly these settlements along the Jordan border have meant to have been for strategic reasons. It's, more, it's not just because they, they see that the, the need for land amongst their people. And you can see how Jerusalem has grown. It now, uh, uh, it, uh, the suburbs really extend almost up to Ramallah and almost down to Bethlehem. And even though Israel is not large in general, um, Jerusalem has definitely experienced sprawl, and a lot of that by design of the Israeli government. Here is Hebron down here, the other holy city for Jews and Muslims. This is Hebron, and you can see that uh, because of the, the intifada and the Israeli crackdown, uh, Hebron, because it's holy to Jews, has received more oppressive treatment than others, and it has really prevented tourists from easily having access to that. And so a lot of the shops in Hebron streets are just closed. There's just no business. Nobody's coming. Uh, to, uh, no tourists are coming. Um, yeah, that would have been the relatively good times. In the 1990s, relationships were improving between the Palestinians, and uh, things have gotten bad since the start of the Second Intifada in the year 2000. This is uh, another uh, street in Hebron. This street shows you, Hebron's unique because it's the one city where Israeli settlements literally exist on top of Palestinian houses. Where, because the city is so holy, 
uh, Israeli settlers insist on living right in the center of the city, and in some cases they've moved in right on top of Palestinians, and that is the case here. Here you have a Palestinian street, and up above on the upper floors, Israeli settlers living. And what they've done is uh, the Palestinians have put up a fence to prevent the Israelis on top from throwing all of their trash down on the street below. And you can see the garbage piling up uh, here. And uh, uh, up above, there's also barbed wire. And at the end of each street, there's Israeli soldiers' watchtowers to make sure that the, uh, the Israeli settlers are safe. And here's a close-up of the garbage um, just thrown on the street below uh, where the Palestinians live. You know, it's kind of a mixed, th th I think the Palestinians have mixed feelings with regards to the uh, Israeli soldiers. On the one hand, they certainly have resented the Israeli soldiers' treatment on occasion. On the other hand, though, uh, at least the Israeli soldiers' behavior is more predictable than the Israeli settlers. Because the Israeli settlers are allowed to have guns, too, for their own pr protection. Palestinians uh, don't e have easy access to firearms. And uh, the Israeli settlers... Um, are, are very scary to the Palestinians because if, you know, the, the, my Palestinian guide told me that on occasion uh, he's had Israeli settlers point, point their firearm right at him. And, you know, if he looks around, there's no Israeli soldier and the guy pulls the trigger, who's going to know what happened? And he's really, he, it's, a, it's a very vulnerable position to be in. So in many ways, they, uh, some of the Palestinians almost appreciate at least the Israeli soldiers being nearby to protect them from the Israeli settlers who uh, can be radical on occasion. And here is, uh, here's some example of Israeli settlers. They're just going out jogging down the street of Hebron with their, uh, their assault rifle. And uh, the Palestinians are not even allowed to use this road. They have to walk on the sidewalk over here on the other side of this barrier. And over here you would have the, the Tomb of the Patriarchs. And I must say, even for me as, a, as an American tourist, it was rather intimidating to just see someone jogging with a, an assault rifle who is obviously not in uniform, who's, who's not uh, uh, a soldier, but nevertheless has this very uh, um, offensive weapon. This is in Jerusalem itself, and you can see that uh, in, this is in the Muslim quarter, and this is a very provocative uh, house. What happened here is that a Jewish home, a Jews owned this home prior to the founding of Israel. And then when the Israelis took the city in 1967, the family that had previously owned it was allowed to move back in. And they have never let the Palestinians in the Muslim quarter forget it. And they fly the Israeli flag all over it. And even the, uh, the, 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 the director who I told you was in charge of religious relations, he said that, that that was incredibly provocative and he really wished that they wouldn't do that. But uh, uh, they continued to do it. This is... Uh, looking back at Jerusalem from the settlement known as Malal al-Domim. This is a famous one uh, because the Israeli government has tried on several occasions to annex this to the city of Jerusalem to make, uh, well, to, give, to provide uh, more Jewish population for the city of Jerusalem, which would strengthen their claim on all of the city, including East Jerusalem. The, this is the one spot that the U.S. government, even George Walker Bush, put his foot down, and he said, you are not annexing this settlement to Jerusalem. And what it underlines, and it has not happened, I mean, it, is, it remains unattached. And this is all the construction that the Jews had started when it was come to a screeching halt by even George Walker Bush, who was a, a strong advocate of Israel. But even he says, you are not going to do this. And it stopped. It shows you the power of the United States to make these settlements stop. When, when we want to, we can make them stop. In this case, we did stop it. Elsewhere around the West Bank, the settlement building continues. Yeah, if, if, there is, if the Palestinians had received the same deal today, they would most certainly have accepted it because, uh, uh, yes, but, at the, but yeah, from their point of view, view at the time, though, 
they felt that they were being forced to sacrifice too much, and they felt that it was a huge injustice at the time. Of course, little did they know that the Israelis were going to win war after war after war, and now, of course, that would be a great deal if that deal was on offer, but of course it is not. Yeah, yeah, the, the Arab, the Arab uh, well, there's some debate on how much that was really the case. Uh, it is true that many Palestinians fled their homes for fear of the fighting. And I think it is true that the Arab countries and the Arab army said, yeah, come, come to us and we'll, we'll win back the land and then you can go back. But, but it wasn't just, uh, it wasn't just um, uh, Palestinians fleeing for that reason. In some cases, uh, they were forced out. I mean, yeah, that happened too. So uh, the, it was, it's fair to say that both both happened. Yeah, this is a, a shows you that this is a highway, and the Palestinians uh, in the West Bank have to have the green license plate. They are not allowed to drive on certain roads. Uh, the yellow license plate is a uh, an Israeli citizen or an Israeli approved car. They can drive anywhere, and uh, the best roads in the West Bank are reserved for um, Israelis only. Uh, this road happens to be uh, allowed for both, but um, and the green license plate wouldn't. These, this would not be an Israeli citizen, and this is an Arab Palestinian who does not have Israeli citizenship. He would not be able to drive that car into Israel. This is a uh, refugee camp uh, outside of Jerusalem, Aida. Um, this arch and this key refers to the fact that the Palestinians have not forgotten their homes. Uh, and the keys that went with them, uh, similar to the Jewish diaspora of old when they, the Jews kept their ch keys when they were kicked out of Jerusalem. Uh, the Palestinians have adopted that symbolism and they too uh, have not wanted to relinquish the claim to go back to uh, the land that they, that they are refugees from that is now part of the state of Israel. And the United Nations helps with the administration of this camp. Uh, the United Nations Relief Works Agency. It's almost exclusively for Palestinians, both in the West Bank and in, um, and in Jordan and uh, surrounding areas as well. It's interesting, right in Jerusalem, there's still, there's still a United Nations uh, outpost uh, right on the, what was known as the Green Line, where the ceasefire happened in 1948. Even though the Israelis have taken all of Jerusalem and the West Bank since, they still have their observation post on the same line uh, through the middle of the city, uh, it's like they're, uh, they're, a, they're UN observers without a purpose at that point. These are some uh, Palestinians who look like they could use a job. Uh, this is actually happens to be in Jordan, uh, in uh, 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 Baca, the largest refugee camp in Jordan. This is also in Baca, Jordan. Uh, Palestinian refugees, uh, children going to school. And this is in... Uh, Bethlehem. This is the Palestinian police force. In certain cities, they are allowed to have their own police force. And uh, here you can see pictures of Yasser Arafat and uh, uh, the, the current uh, Abu Mazen or um, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, uh, the current uh, president of, of the Palestinian Authority. And uh, so you have here um, a representation of the um, Palestinian police force. Now this, the government uh, in, in the West Bank is controlled by Fatah. That is the secular Palestinian party. That was the, the party of Yasser Arafat. And although, uh, you know, before Yasser Arafat accepted the right of Israel to exist, the United States considered him and his organization terrorists. And that's true, but uh, after he accepted Israel's right to, to uh, exist, he, um, he became acceptable to the United States. And now, his organization is much preferable to the alternative. The Palestinians are divided between uh, Fatah, the secular organization, the secular party, and Hamas. Hamas is the, uh, uh, the religious party in Palestine. It's the, it's the Muslim party that wants to bring about Islamic law and, 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 uh, and is considered by the secular Palestinians to be extremists. And so, uh, you know, it's just as the secular Jews have their problems with the ultra-Orthodox Jews in Israel, you have the secular Palestinians who have their problems with these, these uh, uh, fundamentalist Muslims who want to bring about uh, is, uh, uh, Islamic law, Sharia law. And they, the Hamas won the last election. 
in uh, Palestine, in which case Fatah then proceeded to take over the West Bank and Hamas is now left with control of Gaza. So you basically have the, almost the, a civil war going on within Palest Palestine between Hamas the, 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 and in the Gaza and the, the Fatah in the West Bank. And the United States definitely prefers Fatah between the two. And uh, this uh, girl, pal uh, Palestinian girl in Bethlehem, um, she was telling me that she, she is one of the Palestinians in the occupied territories who would prefer a one-state solution. They, she would like to see uh, both Palestinians and Israelis live together under one government with equal citizenship. There's more and more Palestinians who actually subscribe to that solution. For so long, Palestinians have been talking about um, having an independent state separate. Uh, and still the majority prefer that, but now almost 25% of Palestinians now are actually preferring now a one-state solution. Unfortunately for them, the Israelis are not keen on that because, as I explained, they're not keen to take on the added Muslim population that would come with all of the West Bank and Gaza. So uh, if Israelis are going to resist a one-state solution, if they can at all help it, they would much prefer a separate Palestinian state as the lesser of two evils. This is a, a, a Palestinian clerk in the same shop. Uh, this was a man. He showed me something that I found rather disturbing, but he's basically tattooed a cross showing that he's a Christian in Bethlehem. Christians used to be the majority in Bethlehem, and now they're not. Most of the Christians and Palestinian are leaving. Why are they leaving? Because they can. Uh, they have Christian connections outside of, uh, of Palestine that often provides them with the financial resources and the uh, visas necessary to get out. And in a, and what is known as the occupied territories, there's not a lot of economic opportunity. So Christians are leaving in s significant number. Palestinian Christians are leaving, unfortunately, and now Palestinians are now a minority in the, the town that, uh, that bore Christ, Bethlehem itself. And this has uh, been the backlash of that. This man has tattooed the fact that he's a Christian and he is feeling um, alienated in his own town by the growing Muslim population relevant to the Christian population. And he was particularly concerned about Hamas agents who happened to be in the city. And I, I asked him if I was in any danger because Hamas was, had a presence in Bethlehem. And he said, absolutely not. Hamas is not going to kill the tourist trade. Uh, you know, it's, um, the dollars are important for them too. So he says, you have nothing to fear. But he says, I'm, I'm concerned about it. And I don't, I'm not comfortable with Hamas controlling the city council of Bethlehem. And he says, and we're, we're going to defend our Christian community in this town if, if that's what it's coming to. And so I said, do you mean that, uh, are you planning some violence or anything? And he says, yes, we plan, uh, you'll be seeing us on the news. So unfortunately, uh, that's something that, uh, will have to pay attention to and because they've they haven't got a name for their organization yet but they are taking on the attributes of a gang this is the Jordan River and as you can see uh, as they say in Jordan there's more there's <laughs> there's more history in it than water because um, and that's and that's no accident it's because the, everybody and their grandmother has siphoned off the water for agricultural purposes north of uh, the Dead Sea here. And so by the time it reaches the Dead Sea, which is where I'm close to here, uh, there's very little water left in the Jordan River. And uh, it, the Israelis in particular have a lot of control over the headwaters of the Jordan River because they, have, they also have claimed the Golan Heights from Syria in the 1967 war and control the Sea of Galilee, which feeds it. This is the bridge over the Jordan River into Jordan, and I crossed. This is the checkpoint between the two. Israelis are not allowed to cross here. Um, uh, Palestinians can cross here. International tourists can cross here. Israelis are supposed to cross at the actual border between Jordan and Israel proper. The West Bank is not considered Israel proper. Therefore, it's not a proper crossing point for Israelis. Yeah, it, yeah they called it the Allenby Bridge, although I think they... Well, they did, but I, they've officially changed the name, I think, to the K King Hussein Bridge. But, but they, a lot of people, I called it the Allenby Bridge when I was there as well. After General Allenby of the British. Uh, this, is, this is Jordan itself. You can see the terrain. And like I said, the Palestinians who fled 
who became refugees and went to what is now Jordan, now outnumber the indigenous, what they call the East Bank uh, residents of Jordan. And here you have uh, the King, king Hussein and his uh, son Abdullah, who is now the king uh, when King Hussein died. And uh, they are descended from uh, Sharif Hussein, who fought uh, against the Turks with the British. And the British rewarded his family by giving him Iraq, uh, his one son, Faisal Iraq. He became king of Iraq. And the other son, uh, uh, um, Abdullah, became king of uh, Jordan. Unfortunately for them, they lost control of Saudi Arabia when the Saudi family uh, kicked out the Hashemite family uh, after the First World War. And so, uh, obviously, the king of Iraq is long gone, but the king of Jordan and his descendants remain. And so here's the Jordan police force, and you can, I, I, I thought their hats were quite interesting. This is a, a uh, kafia, uh, typical Arab uh, headwear, and this one is red. And there didn't used to be an important distinction between the colors. But it's interesting that now there is becoming one, to be one. Um, red is now represents Jordan, the indigenous population of Jordan, and black and white, more um, symbolic of the Palestinians. And so, although Palestinians are about half the population of Jordan, they would tend to wear the black and white one, and the, the indigenous Jordanians, the East Bankers, uh, the red one. And this is because there's tension between the two. Uh, the indigenous Jordanians and the Palestinian refugees, although they've been given citizenship of Jordan, uh, they're not getting along real well. Um, because although um, the Palestinians control a lot of the wealth because they, they're very industrious, very business oriented, uh, the indigenous Jordanians are more state dependent. And they also control the politics because they're of the, of the, of the king's family. And so uh, the Palestinians in Jordan resent the fact that they don't have access to power in the government of Jordan, and yet they produce a lot more of the GDP or wealth of the society. And so uh, it's unfortunate. And there's no, there's no accident that the King uh, Abdullah of Jordan married a Palestinian, and that was to bridge that tension and uh, bring peace. And, um, and, and what? British, yes, that's right. That's right. Queen Noor, right? Yeah. This is the Palestinian kafia. So, although historically there wouldn't have been a, the, the colors wouldn't have made no difference, and to some maybe the older folks maybe not, but the younger people are adopting the colors as symbolism of who they are and their identity. Oh, the one before Queen Noor. Okay. Right. Okay. All right. Now, in, in fact, Golda Meir, one, it was, I think, was, uh, said, once said that, uh, that, that what do the Palestinians need a state for? They already have one. It's called Jordan. And she had a point. <laughs> a lot of the Palestinian refugees went to Jordan and are now citizens there. And uh, they, in effect, they, they were kind of taking over the country. In, in 1970, they attempted to do it by force. Uh, with the PLO and Yasser Arafat, and the Syrians attempted to help them. And the Jordanian king had to put down the rebellion in what is now known as Black September, when many Palestinians were massacred. And, uh, and the Israeli government came to the defense of the Jordan government against, uh, and against Syrian, uh, Syrian forces. So uh, it's, it's strange bedfellows on occasion. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and, and you know, there are some, uh, there are some Jews uh, in Palestine, who are in the West Bank, who are considered Palestinian by the Palestinians. They're, called, they're Samaritans. Uh, they're a, sec they're a, a sect of Judaism that uh, broke off. They're one of the lost, they claim to be one of the lost ten tribes. And they, they uh, speak Aramaic. Uh, and they don't speak Hebrew, but the Aramaic is also a Semitic language, similar to Arabic. And they are recognized by both the Palestinians as theirs, and the Jews, the Israelis, uh, consider them also Jews as well. Right, so there's, they have citizenship of Israel, and they can also come and go in the West Bank. So it, uh, you know, it, 
it's strange. It's not, it's not this monolithic societies on either side. Um, you know, even before Israel became a state, even before the immigration of the Zionist movement in the 19th century, there were always Jews that lived in the Middle East. And, uh, and they, many of them were Arab. They spoke Arabic. And they saw themselves as Arabs, Arab Jews. And uh, there are still Arab Jews in, in Iraq, and uh, um, uh, there's even some uh, Persian Jews in Iran. But for the most part, unfortunately, since the founding of Israel, there's been this mass uh, uh, segregation in the Middle East where Jews were kicked out of Arab countries as a, as a backlash to the Palestinians being made refugees. And so you've just seen a mass uh, uh, crossover and the whole Middle East has self-segregated along those lines, which is unfortunate, but it's, it's, we have to remember that at one time Jews and Muslims lived quite well together. This is a, an example of, of some of that. These, these are, uh, this is a Bedouin tent. Uh, many of the indigenous population of Jordanians would have been fallen into that category. They're very tribal. That's the other thing about the indigenous Jordanians. Not only do they have the monarchy, but they're also very family connected. And if the Palestinians don't fit in their family, then they are excluded from uh, a lot of privileges. Uh, we got to, I had a chance to stay in this Bedouin tent. Um, it's made out of camel and sheep hair. And it's interesting that, at, uh, uh, that you know, it, once it, it, when it gets wet, it closes up, prevents the water from getting in. And yet when it dries, it opens up and allows it to breathe. Uh, so um, we got to stay. There's a uh, Jordanian Bedouin. And, and a lot of them are f surprisingly wealthy, not only because they're hosting tourists, but also because, uh, as it was explained to me, if you've got 50 goats, and in a year, you have 150 goats. Uh, so your wealth just multiplies if you, as long as you have the grazing land. And so um, you, they don't feel too sorry for the Bedouin. Uh, in Israel, though, they're trying to crack down on Bed Bedouin moving from place to place. They want them to settle down and locate in one area. This is a Palestinian uh, uh, from Jordan. He's a Jordan citizen, uh, but his family was made refugees by the wars with Israel and he ad identifies with being Palestinian, and he's kind of indicative of the distinctions between the indigenous Jordanians and the um, uh, Palestinians, because, you know, he's very industrious, he's got, he's, he's very well educated, the Palestinians are very well educated, uh, they're, like the, they're like the Jews of old, they, you know, they're people without a, a country and a land, but they, one thing that they could adopt was their education, and they knew that nobody could take that from them, and so they really invested heavily in that. So he's got, uh, uh, a degree, a master's degree in physical education, and, uh, and he worked for a school district in Jordan. And uh, he saw that his school district didn't have uh, much athletic equipment, so he got a, a private sponsor to donate uh, sports equipment, not medical, did I say medical equipment, sports equipment for the school, for the athletic program. And he got called to the capital in Amman, Jordan, and he thought he was going to get a commendation. And he went there, and he was call, hauled into a room and they went up with him and they said, do you think you're more powerful than the government? And he said, no, I don't. And he says, well, what are you doing? I mean, the government can get these things. You don't have to upstage the government. You know, we're going to write this down. It's going to go on your report. And this is a warning to you. And so he went back and he couldn't believe it. And, uh, and then later he, he decided that, he, that some, uh, some athletic programs in the city he was working wanted to borrow the athletic equipment, and even though it was school equipment, he allowed them to use it, and he got called back to Amman, Jordan. And again, this is the indigenous uh, uh, Jordanians who are just not, they're just not uh, uh, business savvy. Uh, and he was reprimanded again. He said, this is, they said, this is your last warning. And he said, no, this is your last warning. I quit. And he's gone off and done a profitable business uh, uh, helping tourists around. It's not related to his degree at all, but uh, it just shows you uh, why the Palestinians are the driving uh, force of the economy in, uh, in Jordan. And they, frankly, the Palestinians look at the indigenous Jordanians as kind of hillbillies, really. Uh, they just, they, 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 they're tribal. They're very close to their families. They, 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 they're more socialist. They don't, uh, they're not entrepreneurs. Um, and yet they have all the political power, which the Palestinians resent immensely. And I would, this was a subject I could not bring up in mixed company in Jordan. Uh, it, I, I wanted to examine the relationship between the Palestinians and Jordanians, and that was, I was told that is a taboo subject. Do not bring that up. They do not want to talk about everything's great. Yeah, they don't, yeah thanks a lot for coming, Roland. Uh, but they said everything's great between the two. There is no, there's no problems.
Uh, and this is a picture of Amman, Jordan. You can see uh, the capital of Jordan here and me in the foreground. It was in the ancient times by the Romans, they called it Philadelphia. That was the name of the city back then. Uh, here's some uh, Jordanians walking down the street. You can see their fashion. Um, uh, there is some wealth in Jordan. Um, certainly the Palestinians who live in the refugee camps are poor because if they get any money, they move out. But it's interesting. When they move out, they usually don't move that far away because their families are still in the refugee camp. They move up on the hills overlooking the refugee camps. But does it mean that the uh, young woman with the silver top is not wearing a type of clothes? Well, it means that she's more progressive, that's for sure. It's not required that you, wear, that you cover your hair in Jordan. The only countries that that's required is in Saudi Arabia and in um, Iran. So it's not a law. It's still strongly encouraged, though. And if you travel throughout the Middle East, you'll see it very prevalent now in just about every one of the countries, and it was certainly prevalent in Jordan. So the fact that she doesn't have any head covering could mean that she, either she's not as devout a Muslim or maybe she's a Christian. I mean, your guess is as good as mine. I have no idea who that woman is, so I'm speculating here. They were, uh, no, uh, they didn't have to cover their hair, but they were encouraged to dress conservatively. Yeah. And that's good advice in many parts of the world. I mean, I still remember my trip to India and how there was a, there was a problem because uh, one of the women was, I guess, uh, dressed a little too provocatively and she was fondled. So it, it can become, you dress conservatively and you discourage that sort of behavior. There's some, uh, uh, I don't know if they're Palestinian, but they're Jordanian citizens in, in Jordan. There's another girl walking down the streets. This is one of the industries. You know, a lot of the exports to the United States, about a, a, about a third of Jordan's exports go to the United States, and the vast majority of those are in textile production. And one of the things the United States has done is try to uh, create uh, friendliness between Israel and Jordan by uh, developing these qualifying industrial zones. Basically, they're kind of free trade areas. And the requirement is that 35% of the production has to be uh, uh, made in, in uh, Jordan. And 8% has to come of the production has to come from Israel. So it's an attempt to force uh, economic ties between the two countries. Unfortunately, I, I have to say, it's not working out very well, um, although they are, they are complying with that. And then they're exporting these uh, tariff-free to the United States. And Century Miracle was one of the factories in which this was done. And you saw in here some uh, Jordanian women being employed. Unfortunately, uh, it's not the, it's, you know, that could be better if it was all the Jordanians. Unfortunately, what these companies have done, it's a Hong Kong company that owns this factory. They brought in Chinese workers who are better skilled in making garments. And so they've imported some of the labor. And uh, so you get a, a lot of the labor coming from throughout Asia, and it's not all native Jordanians who are benefiting. Nevertheless, obviously, some are. And this was, they're actually making, uh, this was for, by L.L. Bean. And if you look on some of uh, your labels, you might see this, made in uh, the QIZ uh, in Jordan, the, the Qualifying Industrial Zone. It's kind of, the, um, uh, kind of like a free trade agreement with the United States, Israel, and Jordan. And Egypt is wanting to expand on that as well. This is my last slide, and it, what it shows is uh, it shows you um, this gentleman was a member of the PLO, and this is the, ambas the Israeli ambassador to Jordan. And we were being hosted in his residence, the uh, Israeli ambassador's residence in Amman, Jordan, and he had this party. And he, obviously he, he invited a lot of his acquaintances, including the Pali PLO representative, and so I got a chance to sit down and talk to both of them and uh, about the conflict between uh, the, the Palestinians and the Israelis. And uh, it, was, it was both in heart, uh, it was, was both positive and negative. In that it was positive in that I saw how close the two are and how much they agree on. And of course it was negative and in the fact that small differences seem very huge uh, as far as bridging. Basically, we talked a lot about the, the, the best agreement that Israel had offered um, yet. I guess I should qualify that statement. It was actually Bill Clinton who officially offered it. Uh, Barack, um, Ehud Barak, the Prime Minister of Israel, did not want to uh, annoy his uh, voters by taking credit 
for the offer, but he was willing to agree to it if Yasser Arafat, the representative of the PLO, would. And it was basically, uh, without specifics, it was basically going to give the Palestinians a state in the West Bank and Gaza. The land border would actually be negotiated, and uh, the Israelis would keep some of the settlements. But, um, and that would be a peace agreement that both could live with. Uh, unfortunately, where it broke down on two main points. One, of who had sovereignty over the, t the Temple Mount, or Haram al-Sharif in Jerusalem and who had, um, and it broke down on the Palestinians insisting on the right of refugees to return to Israel, the ones who had fled. Um, there was a last minute attempt by the Clinton administration to bridge that gap before he left office. Uh, it was not accomplished, but uh, at least we're, we, we're, I don't think it was an all, a complete loss. At least we know where we were back then, and if peace uh, relations can continue between the two and we can get back to that point we know how far much farther we have to go and so I don't think it was all for naught but it's it's amazing how close they were to a deal back then and it's all gone to hell since then um, after in 2000 Ariel Sharon uh, who would win the next pal election for Prime Minister of Israel he visited the Temple Mount with an armed force igniting a, a new uprising known as the Second Intifada by the Palestinians, suicide bombing, much more violent than the first one. The bombings, of course, resulted in the building of the wall separating the two, and it has just been a disaster ever since then. So if only we could get back to that, that point. Um, but it was, uh, it was hopeful that I was able to, I mean, to see how well they got along. I mean, here they are just enjoying a social occasion. At one time, they both reminded me, in the 19, early 1980s, he would have gone to prison in Israel for meeting with a PLO representative. And this gentleman has contacts in Hamas as well, and he said that he thinks that Hamas can be brought around to a deal. Uh, that they are, sure, they have their extreme views, but they are, pra they are practical as well. And so he is hopeful that, uh, that uh, Barack uh, sh uh, Obama should reach out um, to Hamas and, and open some diplomatic channels and see what can, can be brought about. Time will tell. Anyway, I thank you all for coming. Um, if there's any questions, I'll be happy to address them. But uh, that basically that concludes... Uh, my talk, and I hope you learned a lot about the current situation with the Palestinians in Jordan, Israel, and the West Bank. Yes? Um, the, the Christian gentleman that you pointed out uh, that, that spoke of you know, some kind of revolution or something, do you know if, if he was uh, Orthodox or, or, or Catholic? Do you happen to remember? Uh, he was... Um, he was, uh, I believe he was Orthodox. Most of them are Orthodox. The, the girl, though, that I showed you the picture of in the same shop, she was Catholic. I remember her specifically saying she was Roman Catholic. Does it sound like the, their revolution or what have you is, is uh, they're crossing uh, denominational lines, or is it? Or are they, yeah, is it, I don't think it was just solely an Orthodox or Catholic thing. I, I, I think it was just a Christian thing. Um, most Palestinians who are Christian, at one time it was about 10% of the population. Now it's probably closer to 3% in the West Bank and Gaza because just so many Christians have left. Uh, because, like I said, because they can. Uh, the, it's, and most of those that remain are primarily Orthodox and then followed probably by, close by the Catholics. Very few Protestants. Uh, and, and those who would be Protestant would probably be the result of missionary efforts. Yeah, There's, the Protestants never really had a strong uh, area, uh, support in that area of the world for historical reasons. In fact, it's amazing to me how much Protestants, some Protestants, not all, but some Protestants in this country support Israel against Palestinians, many of which who are Christian. And uh, although Palestinians have been accused of terrorist activities, some of those terrorists are actually Christian Palestinians. Um, and I, I don't know, I'm at a loss to explain that completely. Uh, I, guess, I guess I chalk it up to this because 
I don't think that many Protestant Christians identify with these Christians in Palestine because they are Orthodox or Catholic. I mean, I, I know people in this country who are relatively close to me who've told me point, point blank that Catholics aren't real Christians. You know, so, so I think it's because of, you know, the, these the Catholic, Orthodox, there's, for some Protestants, not all, but for some Protestants, it's so alien to their idea of Christianity that I don't know if they really even identify with them. And so therefore, maybe it's hard for them to really see their point of view from the Israelis' point of view. They more easily identify with the Israelis. Um, then, of course, there's just some Protestants who think that Israel is going to usher in the end days, and supporting them will only bring that faster. And so there's certainly there's some fundamentalist Christians in the United States who definitely want the Jews to destroy the, the Dome of the Rock and build, build, rebuild the Jewish temple, because that'll be a sure sign that the uh, Messiah is returning. So that's kind of disturbing. I hope that doesn't happen, because if, if they destroy the Dome of the Rock, uh, it will inflame the Muslim world. Um, I hope that's not going to happen. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, economically. Is it safe to do with, with Americans, for example, I would encourage Americans to do that. I'm, I've, I've made that available to my students. I don't remember the organization's name, but I've got it written down somewhere. Yeah, I, I'm aware of it. And, and so you can go to Palestine or to the West Bank, live with a, a Palestinian host family, and help them with the olive harvest. Uh, and help them, and, and in return, I think it's kind of symbolic too. It's not just economic assistance, but in so doing, you're kind of showing your support for Palestine. It's a witness uh, for the rest of the world, and it sends a message again to the Israeli government that that uh, they have powerful friends in the in the United States. And in that sense, uh, the, the, some of the Palestinians, I think, definitely welcome it for that reason. Uh, as far, I, yes, I, I would say in general, it is safe. Go ahead and do it. Is there, uh, but I'm not going to just fool you and say that, that, that Americans haven't gotten killed. Uh, but I, I mean, I, I can specifically remember one girl who was an American student who went to Palestine, and she was determined to get in the, in the way of a bulldozer, an Israeli bulldozer who was about ready to flatten a Palestinian home. And she died. So um, is there, there's the potential there for danger, if it, but I think that's more dependent on how how much you have a stomach for a fight. Uh, in other words, in general, I think it's very safe to go to, um, to parts of the West Bank. Now, I would probably avoid Hebron, because that is a flashpoint. And if violence is going to occur, I was told that's where it's going to be. So when I went to Hebron, I definitely went with a Palestinian guide. I would not have gone to Hebron on my own. But that is a, you know, that is a special circumstance there. Um, certainly, I found I never had anything but welcome and friendliness from any of the Palestinians I met in the West Bank. And so, um, uh, so I think, I think, I would encourage it. Related to that, I belong to a social activist called Search, and um, we're looking at getting um, peace oil for sale to organization members. There are lots and lots of organizations. Olive oil? No, I'm not familiar with that intimately with the organization, so I just know that they exist. Yeah, so I, I'm sorry I can't help you there. I'm going to have to conclude for the sake of the people who have to leave, but if you want to linger, I'll, I'll answer some further questions. But thank you for coming. <laughs>